hear the joy in John's voice as he shares the hope we have in Jesus, the word of life. I'll be reading from 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Who is Jesus? Jesus. Who is Jesus? God. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, I don't know. Um, he's he lives in the sky. He is big and strong. He is, and he's so nice, and he can pick up every day is big. Very good. You know, sometimes it's helpful to start with the basic questions and see what answers you get. And I love how some people don't know and some people just can't stop talking about Jesus. And there's probably many of us can relate to that. We're starting a new series today that will help us get into the very question that those kids began to answer. And uh, the specific ways that we live into what we believe about Jesus, which is actually the more important part. So I'm glad you're here. Uh, we got a little late start today, so I'll try to, to get a little bit uh, short with the sermon here, but I can't make any promises, so you can pray for me. I want to celebrate as we get started today a picture on the screen. This is Sam Vincent, who was baptized at the Greenwood campus last Sunday. He is the second child of Jeremy and Laura Vincent, and he slept through his entire baptism. That is just the kind of mellow kiddo that Sam is, and we just celebrate him so, so very much, and uh, the, the ways that Christ is at work in all of our families. Okay, as we keep our attention on the screen, I want to put some pictures up, and these were probably going to be recognizable to you. I want you to to get at what the meaning is behind each of these pictures, and that'll help us get started today. So the first one, you know, what is that? Does it make you hungry? No, it's not, a, it's not a, that kind of apple. It's a different kind. What kind is it? The kind that represents the technology that has taken over the world, right? So that's what that means. Uh, the next one, and that doesn't make you want to shoot archery, probably. It makes my wife want to go shopping. It's her favorite place. Okay, the next one is, the, is for me. So Starbucks, which represents more than just coffee. You can get free coffee at church anytime. It's more than just an opportunity to pay, to, to pay too much money for coffee. It, it represents something else, a third space actually in society, not just work, not just home, but another place where we connect with one another. And that brand has something to do with, with that kind of connection. All right, these two pictures together now. What does that represent? Every single date night Jenny and I have had since our children were little. Sometimes we start at Starbucks and go to Target. Sometimes we mix it up and go to Target and then to Starbucks. We're just wild like that. The next last one, I think, for a little bit, uh, what, what does that represent? Right, the Olympics. We know it. You can hear the theme song. Bom, 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 bom. You can hear the, is that the right one? Uh, you can hear it in your head. That's what I hear in my head. Uh, and it represents more than just um, some rings, right? We kn this is the power of a brand. There's shared meaning. There's shared experience. There's shared story. Uh, there's, um, there, there's, just, uh, there's more to it than just the picture. The Olympics represent uh, human achievement and athleticism and worldwide unity. And maybe personally you have a connection or a th an experience of, you know, staying up late you know, as a kid or with your kids to watch certain events on TV. <clears throat> and so that brand captures all of that. Starbucks is more than just coffee. Apple is more than just the computer. 
And that is the power of brand, the way we can kind of see a picture and it means a whole lot of things at the same time that, that we share together. I'm going to show another picture, and uh, this is a little closer to home. The next brand is ours here, right? The B stands for Broadway, which you would think means that our church is on Broadway, and it is not, and it has not been for 60 years. So 60 years ago, we moved to the outskirts of town, and they decided not to change the name because the brand, the name meant something more than just the street name. And it literally, this year is the 60th year that we have been off Broadway, so to speak. <laughs> and, uh, and yet it's worked. It represents something for us. Before that, we were on uh, in Broadway in the Bypass. And that was um, from about 1907, 1908. We began even before that as a small group that met on what was then the outskirts of town. And uh, had pulled some people together. And those, just to be on the ground with those people uh, in those neighborhoods, for spiritual transformation, and we continue that legacy and that story. It means different things to different ones of us. Those of us maybe who've been here a long time, one thing, those of us who are walking in the door, another, we see it from the inside and the outside, but there's more than just a B there. Okay, one last one. And this one, too, we also bring different levels of engagement, too. This, if you don't know, is the symbol of the United Methodist Church, which began in 1968, the cross and the flame. Our logo means different things to different ones of us. Some of us were raised as Methodist Christians, and some of us weren't. Some of us got here for different reasons or, or others. Some of us are here because when we were in high school, I know this for a fact, the girl or the guy that was the uh, interest of someone's uh, affection was Methodist. So that's how they, the, you, some of us got here. Some of us, uh, one grew up, one in the couple grew up Baptist and one grew up Catholic. And we don't know what else to do. Just find something in the middle. And that's how you got here. Some of us are here uh, because we're born here and uh, have stuck with this story. And it means different, you know, has different levels of significance to, to some of us. Some of us a whole lot. Some of us very little. And in general, denominations mean less uh, to people in the United States as we go along. There's less allegiance or less connection to that, to that story and to that meaning. And yet, you may not think of this as a global brand, but it is. And just this week, I was having a conversation with a man who was born in Boston, lives in L.A., and spent the formative time of his life in Brazil, and uh, went to a Methodist, a United Methodist school there. He saw the cross and flame, he said, every day when he went to school, and the formative good parts of his life, the, the, a good education and the relationships that he had in Brazil, speaking Portuguese, under the, that United Methodist brand was, was very important to him. We know the story of some of our African refugees who uh, go to the Faith United Methodist Church who uh, came here as uh, sort of a family split apart and in different camps. And um, before they, the family was literally split up and divided up and going to different places, the father set them down and he said, when you get to the United States, look for this and they will help you. They are family. And so that represents uh, the power of a shared story. Uh, the word actually in the Bible for that sharing, uh, if we want to spiritualize this, is fellowship. It's a word that uh, 1 John uses, this sharing in this powerful story of Jesus. And in this next series, we're going to explore that story, our particular version of what it means to be a Christian the meaning and the story and the theology behind our particular, our particular brand. But very quickly, I want to kind of say why we're not doing that. Uh, the reason we're not telling the Methodist story in the next few weeks. We're not doing it because we're stuck on denominations. And the truth is, I think of myself as a Christian first, and I, I, I was baptized as a baby, just as Sam was in the United Methodist Church, but primarily think of myself as a Christian. And, um, and, and truth be told, we began actually not as a separate denomination and with no intention of being that. The goal to begin with was to renew the church from within. We were a renewal movement, a Jesus movement. And I think there's a lot of power in actually thinking of ourselves that way. Because truth be told, uh, institution stuff, bureaucracy, red tape, kind of dealing with kind of that kind of things, those kinds of things can be a distraction from what we're really about. The main thing must stay the main thing, and it can be easy to lose that. What if you felt like you were coming on a Sunday morning to be part of a Jesus movement that was taking over the world? 
that changes your, your, your mindset a bit. And that's what we want to be a part of. Not to come and sit, but come and go. To be sent on mission. There's power in thinking of ourselves this way. So we're not stuck on denominations. Uh, and um, truth be told, don't think of ourselves as better than one denomination or another. That's not the point. And it's not because we even have a different core theology. We didn't begin as sort of a, a, a sort of argument about this doctrine or that doctrine. So these people went this way and these people this went this way. We uh, didn't actually begin with a different core theology at all. Not what separates us is, is our focus, but what brings us together. And that, that actually, as part of a renewal movement, meant we just simply wanted to say, this is what Christians believe, and then put an exclamation point on it. It's not just loving God, as Jesus said, but it's loving God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the point. But how do you do that? And that's more than just what we think about God. It's how we live into a relationship with God. It's not just Jesus. It's Jesus with, with an exclamation point on it. And living out of the reality that we've seen it, we've touched it, we felt it, as First John says. This word, this salvation, this power has been real, and, and we want to lean hard into the Jesus story. That's kind of what it means to be Methodist. That we would be on fire, have a burning desire for God and the things of God. And this kind of passionate Christianity, this call of ordinary people, and the accessibility of the story of Jesus to any people and all people. That's what it means to, to live the Jesus way and to live our way. And it is this call to a certain kind of life of God that I would like to bring us to in these, today and in these next few weeks. To keep our focus and our passion and our intensity up. To remind ourselves why it matters that we follow Jesus. And why it matters to, to each of us as individuals and to our families, but also much bigger in much bigger ways than that. So it is like the book of 1 John says, the word of life appeared right before our eyes and we saw it all happen. And we're telling you this so that you might have fellowship with us. And that fellowship, that sharing, that shared story is with God and his, his very own son. And we share that together so that, so that your joy will be, our joy will be complete because you're included. We're included in this story. Now, uh, there are a lot of reasons we're doing this series now. I'm going to talk about that today. And um, there are different ways for you to engage it. Kind of woven in this, and it's hopefully you will have heard already, ways that you might think, this is my next step in engagement with this particular topic. Last series was on stress, and so, you know, we just had to come in and feel stressed out, and then there's some natural sort of application. Uh, this very much, this series starting today has very much to do with your relationship with God, your following of Jesus, and what it means for you to do that with the kind of intensity and intentionality that we're talking about, that it means to be Methodist. And so that's very personal. There will be a lot of different ways for you to live into that. And I hope you'll just hear some of that and, and choose for yourself as we pray at the end of the, the sermon today. Part of it is for all of us to keep our focus on the main thing, what is most important. We, we are living in times of a denomination under that Methodist brand where there's a lot of discussion about what, uh, which d direction we're going to go, what might divide us. And um, there are a lot of people saying that what divides us is most important. And I would like to say just the opposite, that what divides us and what distracts us often keeps us off focus of what is most important. And so we want to bring our focus on Jesus and what it means to, to, to follow him as a, as a place like Broadway where all these kinds of possibilities are being lived out already. The renewal that we're talking about is already happening. And we simply need to see it and we need to lean in on it and we need to focus on it. And so this week, actually, I'm going to Kansas City for th about three days to be part of, and our, one of our lay leaders uh, is going uh, to be part of discussions with our denomination about the future of the Methodist Church. But mostly what I care about is this, the Jesus way, the, the way that the people here at Broadway are living into the movement of Jesus, and I'd like to keep that focus. And so uh, part of what we're doing is to keep our focus on that main thing. A recent article in Forbes explains why an organization needs to look at its brand every once in a while. Some of you come from a business mindset and could speak to this more definitively. But here's what Forbes says, three reasons. To make sure we're reaching our intended audience. 
And as you and I dream about who is out there that is not in here, as we dream about the power of the story, the simple transforming story of the gospel in people's lives, I hope that we burn with a passion for that intended audience to not assume that people know that they are loved by God and that Jesus died for them. And so part of the reason we do it is to continue our growth mindset. It's easy for us to get into a maintenance mode where we kind of settle on the story that we and rest on the laurels that are behind us rather than pressing forward with passion to the future. And growth isn't just about numbers. I'll talk about that in a second. It is both quantity and quality. But growth must be part of the movement of Jesus or it stagnates and dies. And then to clarify our vision, why are we doing what we do? When we call people to ask people to come to church on Sunday morning, when we open the doors on a Sunday morning, why are we doing this? When we put up a growth group kind of thing and ask people to get into small groups and to talk about their lives and to grow, what's the purpose? Or to read the Bible or to pray or to go and serve. Let's, let's be clear about those things. And hopefully telling our story will help bring that clarity. And this is our goal, to reclaim our identity, to claim and reclaim our identity as followers of Jesus and the simple power of giving our lives to him. And that speaks again to each one of us differently, but I hope that you will find yourself in this story in a 300 year legacy of passionate pursuit of Christ. So uh, this is actually what happened in the uh, mid 1700s in England. So let's go back to 1703 and John Wesley, who was born in that year, and a few pictures of him. He is so very English, and I, I meant to look up exactly how short he was, but he was like 5'5", five, five, very short, short guy. He lived in England from 1703 to 1791. He uh, grew up in a strict Anglican church home in, there in England. His father was an Anglican priest, and his mother was a spiritual force who taught all of the children at home and took that on as her, as her task. She arguably was more of the spiritual leader than Samuel was. He was the priest, but she was the one who was, uh, was driving in many ways the spiritual development of her children. She taught all of her girls to read, which was uh, kind of an uncommon thing at the time. Uh, taught them to read the Bible. She taught them to read in a day, uh, by the way. It's the kind of person uh, that she was. And so he has this very strong spiritual background. Uh, he goes to Oxford. And so then also has an intellectual uh, and spiritual background that's, uh, you know, pretty high standard there. But he began to struggle through his young life with bringing what he had in his head and what he felt in his heart together. And I think many of us can relate to that struggle. Part of the good news of his story is that it not, did not come together until he was about 35 years old. For those of us who are young adults or maybe some of us who are 42 and don't feel like we have it all together uh, or if we're 62 or whatever the age, that there, there is a lot of grace in understanding that this is a process. And John Wesley lived into that process. He was concerned that people would have uh, what he called just a nominal Christianity, that he himself would live into this sort of bland, just kind of whatever happens, happens, uh, lifeless powerless kind of faith and that was in part because of the culture of his time that and that culture I think relates to ours in some ways this is in the couple hundred years after the Reformation and England kind of got caught up in which side they were going to be a part of or who what their identity was from a religious standpoint and their monarchy got tied up into the back and forth of that the sort of ping-pong match of it so uh, they would swing one way and kind of be more Roman Catholic and then the, every, you know, the king would say, this is how you'd be a Christian, and everybody had to be. And then they got pulled more into the reform side and to the Calvinist side and the Puritans who come out of England. And they, this is a very strict way of being Christian, and this is how everybody has to do it. So you kind of rewrite the laws, and it just goes back and forth. As you can imagine, in that context of spiritual and political division, which, again, sound familiar, um, you can imagine what happens to most of the people in the middle. They get kind of tired of it. The masses were disconnected from what it really meant to be a Christian. Everybody was talking about it, but when it came down to it, most people were put off by the discussion and all the arguing and had gotten caught up in, in, and suffered, uh, getting kind of tossed about uh, in the infighting and religious division of their time. The church was weak, 
and became sort of a tool of society geared toward the upper class with little reach into the lives of ordinary people. Again, I think there are some parallels to our time. And so in his young life, John Wesley longed for more. And that longing for more really drove him. It was a point of great struggle in his life early on until he felt settled in it. Some of the early steps that he took back at Oxford was to gather, really after he was sort of a graduate assistant, he gathered with some of the undergraduates and they, they talked uh, and, and prayed and read together and served the poor and went and visited prisons together, just trying to live out their faith in a tangible and powerful way. And then they went to serve, you know, as they served the poor, began to understand that this was something that needed to be lived out. And they went to prisons and different places and worked with children. Uh, so they uh, got made fun of that, uh, the, uh, made fun of because of that. They were, uh, again, most people didn't want you to take Christianity too seriously, and so they got some nicknames along the way. Uh, they were called the Holy Club, uh, I think kind of more by themselves. They were called the Bible Moths because they were always stuck in a Bible. Uh, and eventually they were called Methodists. And that was not supposed to be a good thing. Uh, that method was something that people made fun of, but it stuck. The real transformation happened in John himself as he struggled for his faith to become real and powerful. As a young adult, he had some failure and some significant failure. Actually, charges were brought up on him as he was actually in Georgia as a missionary. Uh, and uh, he fell in love, and then she uh, sort of jilted him, and he uh, didn't let her come to communion. He uh, sort of uh, overstepped his bounds a little bit and had to flee the United States and just felt like he had come to the United States as a missionary to help other people and realized that he didn't have it together himself. And so for years he struggled until 1738 it all came together. And this is what he describes, some of you will recognize this as uh, he was on Aldersgate Street. So Aldersgate, uh, the Aldersgate moment is sort of a famous moment in his life that describes really just a lot of struggle. About quarter before nine, this small group was meeting and they were describing the change to which God works in the heart through faith in Christ. And I felt my heart strangely warmed. We've been wondering for 300 years what that actually feels like to have your heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation and had an assurance. Assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. And so this personal spiritual transformation, whatever that is, and you can't bottle it, but you do long for it, is at the heart of what it means to be Methodist. And, uh, and so what happened then is sort of this beautiful kind of collision of historical forces, all of it seeming to work against them except for two things. And uh, the way to describe it is sort of, uh, sort of how does growth happen? Is it quantity or quality. Quantity meaning let's go preach this message of the gospel to the masses. Think Billy Graham crusades. The crusades of that time were uh, this radical new thing in a very British sort of very proper context. They, they went outside of the church and they preached outside. It was just shocking and they were able to take that message to the masses that way, to working class people who were never going to step into the walls of, of a church and um, th those field preaching e efforts uh, were kind of pioneered by George Whitfield, and John Wesley was exposed to that. And so let's just take it to as many people as possible was one current going on. At the same time, there were these religious societies meaning that said, no, it's more about quality. We need people who are passionately pursuing their relationship with God and who long for what they called holiness of heart and life, living it out in powerful ways. And so those religious societies had been going on and were kind of institutionalized for a couple hundred years before John Wesley. So is it quantity or quality or is it qual quantity? Quality or quantity, which one is it? And John Wesley said, let's do both. Let's get this out to as many people as possible and break all the rules and make that happen. And then let's get them in small groups and let's talk about what it means to really live it out. It's as simple as that. And that simple formula exploded. So I have a few pictures. Uh, field preaching uh, on the screen of uh, uh, one point, uh, you know, in the, the stale church where a couple, you know, maybe 20 people would show up. John Wesley spoke to 5,000 people in one sitting out in a field. So you see the kind of the spark that, that was lit. And a couple more pictures actually of that. It became 
a, a pretty common practice, which would seem weird now. The point is not that we should go out into the, you know, in the street and start, you know, with a bullhorn, start proclaiming the message. I think that's been done. But the point was that they were willing to take a risk. And that picture is actually, uh, as that became controversial, they, they tried, the church tried to shut it down. John Wesley was eventually sort of pushed out and was not welcome in most places where he preached. He was not afraid to, to sort of tick people off. And this is actually him standing on his father's grave. Uh, he was not allowed to go anywhere else. And so he stood on his, it was like his property. That was how that worked. So he stood on the grave to be able to preach, to, to proclaim the gospel to people. They also got into small groups, as I mentioned, and those groups were for people to watch over one another in love. This was lay people, not clergy people like us. You didn't need us to do this yourselves. You got together, and the fervor of this was that people got into groups and talked about making it real, their faith real. And that uh, began to help people actually live it out, and it was explosive. Those lay leaders and then lay preachers became the heart of the movement. And the lay ministry, just ordinary people leading, became essential to how it was lived out. One of the radical things that we did was allow women to preach. This, again, you're thinking middle 1700s was pretty, pretty unheard of. And uh, it is a test case for how we decide how to do things ethically because people said, well, it's in Scripture, it's, it's wrong. And, uh, John Wesley goes to his, his, his mom, it's sort of breaking out, and Susanna, this spiritual force already, uh, says, well, look for the fruit of the Spirit in that and see, the, see the fruit of it and see if Jesus is in it. And he was. And so we leaned hard into it. And then uh, this became just a powerful force on the American frontier. Historically, what happened was the American Revolution meant the Church of England was gone, and the Methodists were, were there with all the tools they needed for spiritual renewal. And lay people just went across the frontier, and they told the gospel to every person that they met as they traveled west. And then they got them into small groups, and they started living it out. And we became the largest Christian group in the United States. The point of all of that is just the simple formula of renewal and the longing for and expectation of renewal that happens when we have our focus on, on the right things and on, on Jesus. One of the strengths of our brand is that is what we call practical theology. People can argue about how many angels dance on a head of a pen, but who cares? But we can think about Jesus in a way that we live out our faith and it's transformative. That's what, that's what we care about. And so the same people who are praying and reading scripture are the very same people who are feeding the poor and visiting prisons. Those gathering in small groups and listening to sermons were doing so to be equipped as agents of change for the kingdom of God. Christians gathered to encourage and challenge one another to watch over one another in love, but also to build hospitals and community centers and orphanages and schools and colleges. I think there's a picture actually of the, their version of that, the foundry, uh, which was, and I've gone, yeah, good job, guys. Um, uh, we actually just, you know, in the last 10 years, just absolutely copied this idea. It was a former uh, weapons foundry, uh, and what they did instead was create a community center for poor people uh, to come and uh, to hear um, not only the message of Jesus, but also to, to be uh, sort of met in their point of need and opportunity. And, uh, and so we've been doing that kind of thing for a very long time. Uh, we have the Little Angels Attic Sale. We celebrated that this morning. We have that in this room. Uh, and we, uh, those, those of you who are on the, the committee, just like you do a lot of work to make this happen. And in one sort of weekend, uh, we transformed this into an agent of social change for ministry to children and families. And then by Sunday, we're worshiping in here again. That's just kind of how we do it. And every once in a while, somebody will say, is it just worship? Or should we, wouldn't, shouldn't we be holding Jesus up more? Or should we, you know, does serving really matter? Does that, is that like, is that what it's really about? And we've always said, yeah, it's both of, of, of those things. In our mission, we call it Invite, Grow, Serve. And it's a way of living into this historical legacy. All of our theology is, to, uh, is intended to transform our lives. And that's what it means to be Methodist. It means to be a passionate follower of Jesus who expects to be able to do the kinds of things Jesus did. It's the Jesus way. And this is why John Wesley loved the book of 1 John. 
because it is focused on Jesus. And we're going to be going through this book throughout the series. You have read it if you were doing our Bible readings. Uh, that was the, the, those were the readings for the last week. But you can go back and read the book of 1 John. There are five chapters. You can get in there and read it. Here's what John Wesley said about 1 John. How plain, how full, and how deep a compendium of genuine Christianity. Well, of course, we all know what a compendium is, right? I looked it up. A compendium is a collection of concise but detailed information on something. He's just saying it's jam-packed in there, this focus on Christ, who we have seen and who we've heard and touched and we give witness to and are announcing and celebrating and we would say singing about and just bringing our intense focus on. This is what First John is about. And this is a, a, a clear um, a choice not to try to look up something new or something novel. First John says, but to, to point to what was from the beginning, just this very basic message of the power and of, of Christ who, who saves us from our sins and is the anointing sacrifice, atoning sacrifice for sin, who is an advocate before God the Father and who is coming again and who this is not something we are to be afraid of, but to have confidence and encouragement in the church that Jesus is transforming all things. First John is a beautiful description of the power of God's love. And in the next three weeks, we're going to be talking about how we think about grace as not this static thing, but this dynamic force in people's lives and in our lives. And that there is really no greater declaration of that love than in what we, that we, what we find in First John. That it says, we love because God first loved us. Everything else comes out of this powerful message that we are loved by God. And there is no time at any point in history where that message gets old. There's no point in your life or in mine where we just kind of like, yeah, we get it. Yeah, we know. Okay, grace, 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 grace. There's a danger in talking about grace so much that we're like, yeah, we get it. We never get it. And the joy of what we do is to come around and like turn the diamond again and again and, and be captivated by this just simple message that we are so loved by God that we will never be the same. This is going to be our focus in the, today and then in the, the next weeks. Which is why, again, we're calling this the Jesus way. It's not that John Wesley wanted to start a Wesleyan movement. He intended to start a Jesus movement. And so do you might imagine where you would fit in that kind of movement, what it would mean to live into and lean hard into that expectation and intentionality. And so this is where we kind of conclude today before we come to communion. What does it look like? And um, so this brings me to another reason why I think we're doing this series now and the way I hope we will do it. Um, it's been almost two months since Megan Davidson passed away. And truth be told, I kind of told myself I needed to stop talking about her kind of in the sermon. Uh, and I would do that kind of like I don't need you all to be my, uh, account, you know, therapist. I can need to, you know, find other places to do my grieving. Uh, so we needed to talk about her in ways that, were, you know, were important for our ministry. And today is one of those days. Because when I think about living the Jesus way, I think of her. And I think about the, the very things that we're hoping for and expecting and talking about. She's an example of that. Um, uh, many of you have been asking, by the way, how people are, and I would say Randy and Drew and Megan's family are, are grieving, uh, continuing to grieve hard, and would just invite your continued love and prayers and support of them. And our church staff is trying to figure out our new normal, even as we kind of push forward, and even as the world keeps turning, and ministry continues uh, to happen, and we, our life and ministry and our impact on the community are things that we care deeply about. But there is something that I hope I don't lose and I hope we don't lose in our community, in our life together from those early days right after Megan died. And that seems like a very strange thing to say, but I felt it almost immediately. There is a, just a clarity that comes in moments like that in our life together that we need to keep talking about. That even in the midst of doing our friend's funeral and, and telling her story to the world, there was a sense that following Jesus really does matter. As simple as that. But here is one example of, of what it looks like when people just keep taking steps toward Christ and keep their focus on him and let the distractions fall away 
and, and begin to just craft all of life in those simple steps toward him. And I could tell you the ways Megan did that, but you know what? It's the way any of us do it, actually, is just taking the next step, taking the next step, taking the next step toward Jesus and, we, and repenting when we don't and uh, letting sin fall away and more of life becoming about him. That is just what it is. And so as you think about, again, what it means to be a Methodist, to be a follower of Jesus, more importantly, and as we prepare for communion, let me just help you try this last thing on for size. As you think about where you fit into our movement, maybe you're here for the first or second time and you're just kind of exploring. Maybe you've been here a long time and you need to feel the fire again. Some, maybe you're somewhere in the middle. Try this on. Uh, this is John Wesley speaking of the character of a Methodist. You can go look this stuff up, but you can't quote half of what he says because you can't understand it because he was uh, old in English. But this is, this is worth sharing. Who is a Methodist, John Wesley asked. And I, he says, I answer, a Methodist is one who has the love of God shed abroad in the heart by the Holy Spirit given to them. One who loves the Lord their God with all their heart and with all their soul and with all their mind and with all their strength. God is the joy of their heart and the desire of their soul, which is constantly crying out, Whom have I upon earth that I desire beside thee? My God and my all, thou art the strength of my heart, my portion forever. May it be so among us. Let's pray together. God, meet us here in the power of of simply standing face to face with Jesus yet again as we confess that we have not fully lived into his offer of grace and redemption stir us yet again to burn with holy fire through him and for him teach us to live out of a burning desire for you and your things for your kingdom and raise our hope and expectation that our steps toward you absolutely matter for our own lives, for those we love, and for your kingdom as it comes on earth, as it is in heaven. For we pray it in the name of the one who promises it, who empowers it, and who sees it to its fruition. Jesus, our Lord and Savior.